I wanted to share something with you guys before we get started this morning. My daughter told me, she said, Dad, you have to open this gift first this morning. And I was like, all right. She said, you can't open anything else until you open this gift. And I was like, all right. So I grabbed that gift and I opened it up and there was nothing inside except for some writing. And she said, on its side, it says, you said you wanted nothing. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so... I got everything I wanted right there. (laughs) Beautiful and has a sense of humor. What more could you ask for? Would you please stand with me this morning as we read from the word of the Lord? We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. Verses 8 through 20 shouldn't be a surprise to any of us in here this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. As we learn about Christmas forever, Luke 2, 8 through 20 says, Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. They weren't just a little bit scared, they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, for you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God with all, for all things that they had see, heard and seen as it was told them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for Jesus and for this wonderful time of the year. And Lord, we love it when Christmas falls on a day of worship like this. We just praise you and thank you that we can come together corporately to worship you and magnify you. And just give you again thanks for sending Jesus, for loving us before we knew you. And I pray that, Lord, if there's any in here that are stressing out over the Christmas time or stressing out over their jobs, whatever it is, that they would take a moment and step back, just have a breath of fresh air and recognize Christmas forever through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. Christmas can be a real busy time of the year. As a matter of fact, Amidst the hustle and bustle, sometimes we can get tunnel vision. We wake up one day and realize that Christmas has come and gone and we've missed what we really, really wanted. We can become weary from stress and attempts to squeeze, that attempts to squeeze our faith out. And, but we come today to worship together to get a fresh touch from the Lord. God's touch is what we really, all we need is for this Christmas. And I hope that that's why you're here today. God delights to reach down from heaven to touch our hearts and for uh, people to be honest enough to admit their need for renewal. You know, the shepherds outside of of Jerusalem, outside of the area there, were probably overlooked by many, but uh, they weren't overlooked by God. The shepherds were among the first to experience the touch of God from the tiny hand protruding up from that manger. And let's face it, if you really do your homework, you'll find out that shepherds were pretty much nobodies. Being a shepherd was not a popular career choice, and shepherds were more like the modern-day garbage collectors. It was a dirty job, but somebody had to do it. As a matter of fact, if Mike Rowe were to go back in time, (laughs) shepherding would be at the top of the list for dirty jobs. God chose to announce his birth of his son through a bunch of nobodies, through a bunch of shepherds. Now, if you and I were to do Christmas, if we were to have done it, we would have done it differently. We would have made sure Jesus, the Son of God, had a proper place to be born and was recognized by the most important people. But I'm glad that God did things His way. You know, if, if Jesus would have been born among kings or queens, if He would have been born among pomp and circumstance, th- there would have been a lot of us that would not felt worthy to come into His presence. We wouldn't have felt, would have never felt accepted by Him because what would ordinary people have to do with 
a king such as him. Jesus' lowly birth is God's way of saying, I accept you, you are welcome here. Regardless of your social status, from the highest to the lowest, you can come to Jesus. Shepherds had nothing to offer the baby Jesus and were the first to be told of his birth to come and see the child lay in the, that laid in the manger. Later, Magi and the wise men from the east came. They were offering the newborn king gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But right from the start, both the rich and the poor, Jews and Gentiles, came to Jesus, see Jesus. None of them had been turned away. God welcomed everyone reaching out through his infant son, with a touch from himself. And today, you and I come to worship Jesus. Like the shepherds, many of us have nothing to offer our Lord, but we need his touch. And God will touch us if we just ask. No one will be turned away. The message of the angels to the shepherds said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Did you get that? Peace to men on whom his favor rests. God is not against you. God is for you. He reaches out to each of us with his great love. God will touch us with his peace and his grace. And through Jesus, the favor of God is upon us. He wants to touch us with his love. We can learn from the shepherd's example to help us to receive a fresh touch from God. Within the story of the shepherds that we all know so well, we can find four simple things to help us reach a fresh touch from God and celebrate Christmas forever. Starting off with point number one is steadfast hope in God. You know, we're not told much more about the shepherds, but we can at least look in and see, kind of read between the lines with them. We do know one thing for certain, certain is that they were Jews. And the Jews were looking for God to send the Messiah they had been longing for, and they knew that he was coming. They knew the Messiah was on his way, and they were looking for him. And they believed that, they were, that he was the one that would set them free from the hated Romans. Now, perhaps at time to time, the shepherds may have looked at each other and started musing the word of the scriptures and they, and, and talk to each other about their common hope in God. They may have even brought up passages such as Psalm 23, 1 through 3, which says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He res restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Or they may have brought up Psalm 29, or 28, 9, which says, Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Or even Micah 2. But you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter. From you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. He will be no upstart, no pretender. His family tree is ancient and distinguished. That's interesting. You can actually take the lineage of Jesus and follow it all the way back to Adam, the first man. The first step to receiving a fresh touch from God is to place our hope in God. We must have faith to believe that God will reach out to touch us. Psalm 33, 18 through 22 says, says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him. And can I just stop right there and talk about the fear of the Lord just for a moment? The fear of the Lord is an important aspect of a Christian's, a believer's life. It's something that should be part of us. It's something that we should walk in on a daily basis. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. It's, it's something that keeps us from doing things that we shouldn't be doing in the first place. It's the fear of the Lord that keeps men on paths of righteousness. It's the fear of the Lord that, the God, is look, that God is looking down to see if that's in our heart. But he says here, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him. Those that fear the Lord... If you fear the Lord this morning, the eye of the Lord is upon you. Isn't that good news? Yes. On those who hope in his mercy. To deliver their soul from what? Death. The eye of the Lord is upon those that fear him. And he's there to deliver their soul from death. Yes, our bodies, our physical earth suits right here will face death, physical death. But yet, if we have our faith and trust in Christ alone, if we've chosen to follow the Savior, we don't have to fear the second death that is reserved for the unbeliever. But rather, we can walk from this life right into the next. We can walk in the life and the wholeness and the newness of him. Amen? That's good news right there. That's good Christmas news, too. He's there to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits on the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. They may have also looked at Psalm 71, 5, which says, For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. And then there's Lamentations 3.25. It says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. I hope this morning that you are hoping in Christ. I hope that you are hoping in his salvation. 
that you have placed your trust in Christ alone. Hope motivates us to keep us going and not give up. Without hope, we don't want to do anything. Have you ever been in that situation where it just seems like all things are hopeless? And you're like, God, what in the world is going on? And if you lose your hope in God, it makes that situation just go completely to pot. But if you have a hope in the Lord, it's amazing how much comfort there can come from Him. I've been in the presence of those who have mourned like they have no hope. And I've also been in the presence of those who mourned who have hope. And there is a huge difference. You see, when one mourns like someone who has no hope, there is, an, a, there is no hope there. There is a, 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 a vexing of the soul. There is a, 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 the thoughts of, of hopelessness and of loss. And that's true. But yet, for those of us who mourn over a death of a loved one who was a saint, someone who had Christ as Savior... We have a hope that we will see them again one day. We have a hope that we will be in their presence. See, right now, as it is, that person has gone on into glory, and they're just waiting for us to show up. They're just waiting for us to show up. Okay, you are awake this morning. That's good news. It's kind of like they've gone off to some great, wonderful place, which they have, and we're still stuck over in, yeah, Sumter. <laughs> Thanks. Looking for the right word there, Chris. <laughs> There's a Peanuts cartoon. Says Lucy and Linus were sitting in the front of a television set when Lucy said to Linus, go get me a glass of water. And Linus looked surprised and he said, why should I do anything for you? You never do anything for me. Then Lucy promised, on your 75th birthday, I'll bake you a cake. <laughs> Linus got up, headed to the kitchen and said, Life is more pleasant when you have something to look forward to. <laughs> and it's true even for the Christian. Life is so much more pleasant when we have something to look forward to. Life can be good one day and can just stink the next. But yet we've got so much more to look forward to. We have a home in heaven where our Savior abides, where, where our loved ones have gone on before us that serve the Lord, that we get to see again one day. Hallelujah. We have hope. Do you have a, a steadfast, unshakable hope in God? You see, hope not only opens the door to receive a touch from God, hope also moves you through the door. Like Linus, when you have hope, you're willing to get up and do something. Without hope, you're paralyzed, incapable of moving forward. If your hope is failing, then ask God to restore your hope. You have not because you ask not. That's right. So ask. God gives us hope beyond just a wish or aspiration. God brings a steadfast, unshakable hope which never fails. Psalm 62, 5 and 6. Find rest, O my soul. We sing this song. And God alone, my hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. I can almost hear Rocky Balboa saying something like that. <laughs> Followed by, Amen! But you know, Christ is our hope. The Lord God is our rock. He is our fortress. Those are big, mighty, strong words. It gives us hope. Psalm 62, 5 and 6, out of the message, says, God, the one and only, I'll wait as long as he says. Everything I hope for comes from him, so why not? He's solid rock under my feet, breathing room for my soul, an impregnable castle, I'm set for life. Hope in God. Hope is the prerequisite. Pre yeah, the, the thing before. Thank you. To receiving from God. Hope also enables us to take a second step to receive a fresh touch from God. Our next thing then would be, it's a simple response, is to take action. The angels told the shepherds where they could find the newborn Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. You see, the shepherds weren't going to find him on a hillside surrounding Bethlehem. The shepherds would have to respond to the message they had received. It was time to take action and go find the child. I could almost hear one another looking at each other saying, Don't just sit there. Do something. And get up and go, right? It's kind of like those four lepers sitting outside the gates. And they looked at one another and said, Why sit here until we die? If we go into the city, we'll die of famine. If we go to the Syrians, maybe they'll have mercy upon us. Why sit here until we die? And that should be our, our heart's cry. Why sit here until I die? 
I'm going to get up and do something about this walk. Amen? If you and I are going to receive a fresh touch from God, then we must make a simple response to God's message to us. We need to act upon what we are told. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And then James 2.17 and 18, 18. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You see, we've got to get up and do something. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. dead. Good, you are this morning. Good, excellent. Good. Because the reason is, is faith without works is dead. Our works show us, or it's kind of or like the outward appearance of the inward change, something that's happened on the inside of us. It shows our faith. This is an incredible story here. Trying to win their case, some lawyers have been known to ask some incredibly unbelievable questions. The Massachusetts Bar Association Lawyers Journal gave the following example. Lawyer said, Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? The doctor said, No. Did you check for blood pressure? No. Did you check for breathing? No. Then is it possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? And the doctor said, No. The lawyer said, How can, be sh- how you, how can you be sure, doctor? The, lawyer, um, the doctor said, Because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar. <laughs> oh, it gets better. The lawyer said, but couldn't the patient have been alive nevertheless? And the doctor said, it is possible that the patient could still have been alive and practicing law somewhere. <laughs> so, to all lawyers listening to this message, uh, we love you. Uh, we know this doesn't, isn't a reflection of you. A body without the brain is dead. Likewise, faith without works is dead. Dead faith does nothing. <laughs> no, you and I need to respond to God's word, to his message delivered personally to us. I'm going back. I, I'm, okay. Dead faith, it, it reminds me there are people out there who say, yeah, I've got faith in Christ, but I don't go to church because I can have church while I'm out fishing. Okay, let's back up here. Faith without works is dead, okay? We're called to gather together as believers. And we are called to, as a matter of fact, the word specifically says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, such is the manner of some, especially as you see that day approaching. Listen, guys, the day is coming fast. We talked about this last week. Peter, Peter even said, listen, it, it, the hour is late. It's upon us. We're, we're here. And that was written 2,000 years ago. That means we're 2,000 years closer to that day. That day is coming. It's right around the corner, and I don't think we've got much time left. I've even had people even say to me, well, I think it's still further out. I don't. You know, if Peter said that it's close by, and if Paul said it's close by, and the disciples wrote about it, and, and John was like, it's close by, and Jesus even himself, when John when was on the island of Patmos, even, even says, watch, be faithful, because the time is short. Then guess what? Time's short. And the reason I say that is because Jesus said it, and I think he's a whole lot smarter than me, and I'll take his word for it. You and I need to respond to God's word, to his message delivered personally to us. Listen, don't wait for an angelic, uh, angelic encounter to uh, go and do what God has asked you to do. You know, or some booming voice from the heavens saying, Joe, I told you to do this. Go do it. No, uh, we need to respond to God's message, not the messenger, but to his message. God could surprise us with angels, yes, but more than likely God's going to communicate, us, communicate to us through personal times of Reading the Bible in prayer. I know that comes as a shocker. Not really, but that's what God will speak to us that way. Uh, he could send his message uh, through a husband or a wife, through a friend, through a song, a sunset, through a sermon. Just different ways that God speaks. The question is, are we listening to his message? Are we hearing what he has to say? We have ears to hear. The question is, are we listening? Let me make it very practical and simple for you. When we have a time of prayer in our service, don't just stay where you are. Don't remain silent. Reach out to others and begin to pray. Let your voice be heard in heaven. When there is a sermon and something touches your heart and the invitation is given, don't just stand there. Don't go white-knuckling it. I've, listen, I have been there. I have done the white-knuckle thing. Y'all know what the white-knuckle thing is? You grab the pew in front of you and you're doing like this. 
I'm not moving. I'm not moving. You're not, yeah, you're talking to me. I'm not moving. I'm not doing it. Not going to do it. But the truth is, God is wanting to do something special in our lives. I see some of y'all smiling out there because you've been there, done that. I got the t-shirt. <laughs> I've done the white knuckle thing. I'm like, God, I know, he's got, you got to be talking to somebody else. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm talking to you. Get up there. Okay. It's that first step that always seems the hardest. But once we take that first step, the rest of it is, uh, seems to be a cakewalk. If our altars of prayer are empty here at church, then what's the condition of our family altar at home? Two of the safest places for us to respond to God is at church and in our home. If we, were, if we struggle to respond to God here or there, then we won't be, when or where will we be willing to respond to Him? Receiving a fresh touch from God begins with a steadfast hope. Hope brings about a simple response, and it motivates us to take action. And God will touch us, but there's more. The next is a strong desire to, to, to want it, to want it. You see, the shepherds went seeking for Jesus, and I wonder how many mangers they had to look in before they found Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in that manger. And don't think, I've gone to God before and nothing happened. You need to pursue God and seek Him and follow hard after Him. This isn't one of those, well, yeah, I kind of looked in my room, Mom, and I couldn't find my, my pants. And, and your mama goes in there and she finds them laying on the floor. Amen? Yeah. Okay? Just because you went to God one time. Jesus even gave the example of the unrighteous judge and a woman went before him and she kept pestering him and hounding him and hounding him. And, hound. and finally the judge was like, you know what? I need to do something about this woman before she wears a hole in me. And he answered her plea and he, he took care of her case. And Jesus said, how much more will the father listen from heaven? If you don't get your answer or any type of answer the first time, don't quit. Don't quit. Go before him again. Continue to ask the father. Continue to go before him. Seek him and you will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 and 14 says, when you come looking for me, you'll find me. There's a promise right there. You can mark it in your Bibles. God himself said, when you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree. And at the risk of sounding oversimplified, here's a formula, if you will, of seeking a fresh touch from God. Number one is want it. Number two is pray for it. And number three is wait for it. And you continue to pray until something happens. We won't wait if we don't pray for it, and we won't pray for it if we don't want it. Again, I go back to what I asked last week. How bad or do we want to see someone saved? How bad do we want to see a situation changed in our lives? How bad do we want that thing to happen that's in God's will? Listen, I'm not talking about manipulating God to get your way. We're talking about seeking and saving the lost and seeing bondages broken and seeing people set free. What are you willing to pay? Do you want a fresh touch from God? You know, usually the waiting part isn't long. God's touch is given for us, and it's given to us to receive, even as we're praying a lot of times. The Lord loves to hear us express our desire to be with Him and sense a fresh touch from Him. God promises to hear and answer that kind of prayer. I hope when you come into worship, before you come into the worship service, that you just ask the Lord. You can even try this. Tell, you just ask the Lord, Lord, would you meet me today in a worship service? I choose to meet you. I choose to worship you and to love on you. Would you meet me here today? I promise he's going to show up. He's not going to turn that down. He's a loving father. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. The Lord's desire is for us to have a relationship with him. The Father's desire, and you say, well, how, can, how do you know this, Pastor Jason? God sent His only Son, His only begotten Son, so that we can have eternal life with Him, to have a restored relationship with Him. He's not going to turn down a kid that says, Lord, would you meet with me today? Now, if you're purposely living in sin and indulging in a sinful lifestyle, and you say, well, I just want to meet with God this Sunday morning, don't expect anything there. Repent, please. 
follow hard after the Lord. But I got a feeling if you're living in sin, you aren't going to want to meet the Lord at the altar. You're not going to want to meet the Lord in the worship services. That can be a scary thing. But if you're seeking after him, you've repented and you, and you ask him, he's there. He's willing to meet you here. This brings us into number four. Share God's touch with others. Don't overlook the end of the shepherd's story this morning. Luke 2, 17, 18, and 20. When they had seen him, listen to this, evangelist right here. They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things that they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. Don't keep God's touch just to yourself. Don't keep salvation just to yourself. Share it with somebody. Share it with people. When something good happens and you can't help but to share it. Good news! Reminds me of that boy at camp. He got saved. He wasn't all there, but he got saved. And he'd run around telling everybody, good news, good news. Told him about Jesus. He received good news. Have you ever felt like you just were going to burst if you didn't share something? I think we've all been there at one time or another. I'm sure that's how the shepherds felt that day. They thought, man, if we don't get this out, there's going to be shepherd guts all over the place. We got to share this good news. I'm just going to blow up right here. You know, what father or grandparent in a hospital doesn't have either a pocket full of change, well, that's kind of gone by, but, or a cell phone in hand, just waiting to call friends and family and everybody they know about the new birth of their, or the birth of their new, new baby grandchild or their son or daughter. You know, maybe this story has lost its excitement for you. You just need to be remind, reminded that's how awesome it really is. If it's not burning in your heart to share it with somebody, then maybe it's gotten old for you. Has the story of Christmas lost its wonder? Does it need to be rekindled in your heart? The Holy Spirit is here and he can fan, he can fan those embers and turn it into a flame if you just let him. What can you do to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in this process? Listen, if you have trouble sharing what God has done, then let me suggest you to the following. Number one, ask God to reveal the condition of your heart. Let the Holy Spirit search your heart and find the fire quenchers that need to be cleansed and removed. These could be uh, disbelief, discouragement, distractions, and disappointments. Number two, you can maintain close relationships with other believers. I cannot stress this enough. We talked last week about the difference between you now and the you five years from now or the people you hang around with and the books you read. And the people you hang around with, once it... Either, they're either going to sharpen you spiritually or they're going to dull you spiritually. And if you've got ones that are dulling you spiritually, it's time to find new friends to hang around. There's nothing wrong with that. It's time to pull up the stakes and move. And then once you find that good set of friends that start sharpening you, you can go back and minister to those people. But don't let them dull you down again. Sharpen them. Sharpen, let the, you know, be with people that are going to sharpen you. You know, a single candle doesn't provide much light more warmth, but many lights together accomplish more than they can do alone. So I encourage us to spur one another on to do good works and do things that God wants us to do. Remember the power of truth is the third thing. Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit will lead us in all truth and he'll guide us in paths of righteousness and keep us on the Lord's paths of righteousness for us. The truth has set you free and the truth will set others free as well. And again, let's pay the price to see others set free from the bondage that they're in. Remember, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will do the work. Just be obedient to what He tells you to do or say. Don't give in the lie that would say, you don't know enough, you're not close enough, you haven't been good enough. You realize that's a form of pride. It's also an attack of the enemy to keep you from doing what God has asked you to do. Your confidence should not be in yourself, but in God. The shepherds share their experience, and you can share yours. If God used shepherds to announce the, the birth of the Christ child, how much more can he use us? He can use each and every one of us and share where you are. As Bruce comes this morning, I want to say that the angels did not announce the
the birth of Christ in a synagogue. They came to where the shepherds were. They were out in the fields tending the sheep. Inviting someone to church is good. But God can touch that person right where you are at with him or her. Because you are God's ambassador. That is a big word. It says basically you are instead in his stead going out there and doing what he came to do for us and sharing the good news of Jesus. Remember, it's better to give than to receive. Sometimes we wait to give because we feel like we need to receive first. We know it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's time to act on what we know and not on how we feel. It's time to go ahead and give instead of waiting to receive. When we give Jesus to others, he will likewise give us a fresh Christmas touch. As we give, he gives. So where are you at this morning? Have you lost the sight of Christmas future or Christmas forever? Do you need a fresh touch from the Lord? Would you stand with me? I want you to seriously consider the sermon this morning and ask the Lord to search your heart. As Bruce leads us in a song, I want to open up the altars this morning. If you need a fresh touch from God, if you've just become bogged down by the, the, the hustle and bustle of this time of year or by work or by travel or by anything else and you just need a fresh touch from the Lord, would you take a few moments, I beg you, to, to come forward and, and meet with the Lord at the altar? If you need prayer, I'm up here as well. I'd be more than happy to pray for you if you need a touch in your body for healing. I believe the Holy Spirit is here this morning to heal. So would you come as Bruce leads us in a song? and to bless to kneel in humble reverence before your holiness come to give you honor to love you and obey to bow down in your presence and worship you today Lord let our worship be a precious gift
Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your touch upon our lives. Lord, you know every need in this place right now at this altar. And we're believing you to meet every need according to your riches and glory. And Father, we thank you for a peace that passes all understanding upon us, especially as we're celebrating the, the birth of Jesus Christ today. As we worship you, we praise you. I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you for your, your hope that indwells us, that we have uh, something to look forward to from this life. We've got a great re eternal reward and inheritance in you. We thank you for Jesus, for sending him as a lowly babe. We thank you, Lord, that you didn't send him as a king, as, as, a, as in, a, in a king's palace, but you sent him in the manger so that we all could feel that we could approach him. And we thank you that you are approachable, Father, through Jesus Christ. We thank you again for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Lord, I thank you for your touch upon each and every one today as they've reached out in faith to believe you for it. We love you, Lord, and praise you. Use us for your glory. And I thank you for a boldness to speak your word by stretching out your hands to heal. And that signs and wonders will be done through the name of your holy child, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Bless you. Be blessed today. Merry Christmas to all. If you need prayer, I'll be up here at the altar. Thank you so much. You're dismissed. <laughs>